Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're yeah, welcome. So, chemistry 156 is a continuation. Today we're going to deal with another topic, and that is concentration, the red law, and experimental determination of rate expression. Okay, concentration is one of the factors. It's one of the factors that does affect the rates of reaction. The purpose of performing experiments, this kinetic experiment, is to write the rate expression, which is the rate law. And how you can also determine the rate law experimentally. And so anytime, I'm talking about rate expression. I'm talking also about the rate law or the rate equation. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna take the factor concentration today. I'm gonna to treat it in detail and uh, also how you can write the rate law. I told you concentration has to do with the number of moles you are looking at, or essentially the number of particles. If you increase the concentration, you increase the number of particles. And the more they collide, and the more faster, the more they can also form products. So that is why concentration is very important. It's like the way you are, if you have more money, there is tendency to spend more of that money. So as you increase the concentration, you increase the number of particles, and then they are closer, they can react and give you more of the product. So we're gonna look at it. Uh, the, we're gonna look at the factor concentration. And then what are you expected to do? The objective of this unit essentially is unit two. In this unit, you will learn more how to write the rate law and use it to predict the speed of chemical reactions. And so if you say concentration does affect the rate of reaction, how can you use it to explain? So immediately you were able to write the rate law, the rate expression, rate equation, and then you can use it to predict that if I increase the concentration of this reactant, obviously I'm going to increase the rate of a chemical reaction and how you can determine the rate law experimentally. And so I'm going to be repeating so many things today. And as I repeat them, I will tell you why I am repeating such phrases or such expression. The rate law, the rate equation, the rate expression, essentially they mean the same thing when I am using it to explain. And I said the purpose, or one of the reasons why you are doing this kinetic uh, experiment is to write the rate law. It's from the rate law, you can see very clearly the effect of concentration. Look at the end of this unit. This is unit two. At the end of this unit, you should be able to know the effect of concentration, how concentration does affect the rate of reaction. You're able to determine the order of a reaction. And then you can write the rate law or rate equation or rate expression. And of course, you should be able to do some calculations. So these are some of the things you are expected to know from this unit. At the end of this unit, if you don't know all the things you can see on the screen, it means you didn't understand fully what I taught you. 
So let's keep going. Look at that. Why are you raising your hand, Kazim? Okay. Kaz Kazim. Okay, concentration and the rate law. What happened is that the rate of most reactions, they change when the concentration of the reactant changes. As I said earlier, referring to you, that you spend more money when they give you more. You just keep spending because you have more money. That is a trivia example. It's applicable in chemical reactions. As you increase the concentration, the rate can also increase. And in general, the rate is proportional to the concentration of the reactant raised to appropriate powers, indices, or exponent. Just as what you did in mathematics. I'm referring to indices, the same thing as exponent, the same thing as power. So the rate, the rate at which you spend your money is proportional, should be proportional to what you have in your pocket. And that's the tendency to spend more if you have more in your pocket. But in chemistry, there's also, it's also possible that the rate of a reaction is proportional to the concentration of the reactants raised to the appropriate power, or the power is the same thing as indices, or the same thing as exponent. And so they, are, they all mean the same thing. They all raise, you raise the concentration of the reactant to appropriate power. So the rate of a reaction is proportional to the concentration of the reactant. Later, we're going to remove the proportionality constant and find out what, how we can make that expression equation to be equal. Rate will be equal to what? But right now, I said the rate of a reaction is proportional to the concentration of the reactant raised to appropriate powers. OK, the rate of a chemical reaction is proportional to the molar concentration of the reactant raised to the appropriate power. Look at what I mean by molar concentration. I told you when it is like this. The rate, of, the rate is proportional to the molar concentration of the reactant raised to the appropriate power. When the square, I told you the square bracket, it stands for mole per dm cube. So let us consider equation six. Let us look at equation six. You have the, the so many number of moles of A reacting with so many numbers of B to give you products or products. Look at that. This is the number of moles of A. And where is the number of moles of B? When they react together, it will give you product. That is equation six. The above equation is like hydrogen is like A, and B is like oxygen. And that will give you product H2O. This oxygen and hydrogen are the reactant and the product is H2O, water. So the rate of this reaction equation six is proportional to the concentration of A raised to a power or concentration of B raised to a power. And that is the product of concentration of A raised to a power, concentration of B raised to a power. And I told you equation C is, is like, A is like hydrogen, B is like oxygen. I just balance it. And those are the reactant, hydrogen and oxygen, they are like reactant. But if you have an undefined equation, then you can refer to hydrogen as A, 
and oxygen as B. So follow that, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> follow that equation six. We're going to use it, the reactants are A and B. And how do you use that to write the rate law? You can write, I've told you, the rate of decrease of A to represent the rate of reaction or the rate of decrease of B. Remember, you have the X mo of A and the Y mo of B. So you take them into concentration when you're writing for the rate of decrease of A and the rate of decrease of B. Okay, look at that. That is equation six. In equation six, the X and the Y are molar coefficients. This X is for A and Y is for B, respectively. So how do you write for the rate of decrease of A, as I taught you? The rate of decrease of A. How do you write for that? Look at that. A, DA, look at the equation 7A. DA over DT is the rate of decrease of A. Because you have X more of A, you divide it, it's going to be 1 over X. Remember, A is a reactant. So if A is a reactant, then you, you put a negative sign in front of A. Look at the negative sign here. Look at equation 7A. The whole of this. Look at that on your left hand side of or your left hand side. It stands for rate, and that is proportional into a raised to a power. Look at this n. The n is the exponent of power, and the m is the exponent or the power of b. So the rate of decrease of a divided by the molar coefficient stands for rate. The whole of this can be represented by capital R. Look at that, capital R which stands for the whole of left, or R-A-T-E, that is rate, it is proportional. If you remove the proportionality constant, you put K there. K in equation 7A is a proportionality constant. What do you call like velocity constant or reaction constant? Okay, instead of using A, you can write for B, the rate of decrease of B, which I've taught you, is dB over dt. Look at that. But because you have Y more of B, then you divide it by one over Y. Remember, B is a, is, is a reactant. So you put negative sign in front of 7B. So you can use 7A or 7B to stand for the rate of a chemical reaction. You can use 7A, you can use 7B. 7A or 7B, they're just explaining to you that the rate of a reaction is equal to the specific rate constant into the molar concentration of A raised to power N or the molar concentration of B raised to power M. It's the same thing, you can use 7A if you like. You can use 7A or you can use 7B. Okay, so this is where we are now. You can use 7A, you can use 7B. In a minute, I'll be with you. Let me clear the screen for you. Just a minute. Okay. And look at equation seven. K is the specific rate constant of the reaction. And A is raised to power N. N is the other respect to A. And M is the other respect to B. Then what is N? N is order with respect to A and M is order with respect to B. If you add them up, it will be M plus N. 
And that is the overall order of the reaction. Equation seven is known as the rate law. Equation seven is known as the rate law. And so the purpose, the purpose why you are doing this experiment to be able to write a rate law, to be able to write the rate law. Okay, is to be able to write the rate law. The rate law is an expression for the rate as a function of concentration at a fixed temperature. So equation seven, you can use seven A or seven B to write. You can use seven A or seven B to write the rate expression for the reaction. You can use seven A. If you don't want to use seven A, you can use seven B. And that those expressions, you refer to them as the rate law, rate equation or rate expression. Anyone, they just, you're talking about the same thing. But those experiments, you have to do experiment to determine the value of N or the value F of M. Those exponents, you have to determine them experimentally, especially if a reaction is made up of so many steps. Remember, there are factors that affect the rate of reaction. I said concentration, temperature, okay? And uh, concentration, temperature, catalyst, and all that, that I listed at the beginning, okay? But in this case, we are only looking at the effect of concentration on the rate of chemical reaction. Effect of concentration on the rate of chemical reaction. And we're able to establish the rate law. What is rate law? And I'm gonna define it in so many ways as we go along. The rate law is the experimental relationship between the rate of the reaction and the concentration of the reactant raised to appropriate power. Or X is an expression that we explained to you clearly how the concentration of the reactant, how they are affecting the rate of a chemical reaction. And the exponent, the power of each of the reactants is the power of each of the reactants is known as the order of that particular reactant. As we go along, we're gonna do more. Okay, look at that. The determination of the experimental rate law. And I told you that the purpose of performing this reaction is to be able to write the rate law. If you write the rate law, then you can explain the effect of concentration on the rate of a chemical reaction. Look at most chemical changes consist of so many steps, multi-steps. And each step is known as elementary step. I've explained to you what do you mean by elementary step. As we go along, when I decompose the nitrogen pentoxide, it's made up of elementary step. It's the totality of these elementary steps that will give you the overall order of the reaction. And then different reactant. If you have A reacting with B, A has its own effect on the formation of the product. B has its own effect. So different reactants can affect the rate of a reaction in different ways. And so you need to find out the effect of each of the, of the reactants on the rate of reaction. Consequently, equation seven cannot be written from the balanced chemical reaction but it has to be determined experimentally. That equation seven, you can write, look at I go back again, look at that. Equation seven A, you cannot write equation seven A by just looking at the balanced chemical equation. Look at the balanced chemical equation, for example. Look at equation six. Equation six is a, you can take it as balanced chemical equation or look at hydrogen reacting with oxygen. You cannot use this to write the rate expression. You have to determine experiment, experimentally the order with respect to each. Look at that. N, N is not the same thing as this X, okay? M is not the same thing as Y. Therefore, 
There is need for you to perform experiment to determine N and M for each of the reactants. That is the purpose why you should perform experiment. In a situation where you don't need experiment before you can get the value of N and M, when we get there, I will explain to you. But where we are now, you have to determine N and M experimentally. Once you know the value of N, and you know the value of M, then you can write the whole of equation seven. That rate, you don't need to write what is on your left again. You can use R-A-T-E or capital R to just represent your left-hand side. Or you can use equation seven B. I've explained to you that N is the order with respect to A and M is the order with respect to B. The total, the overall order of equation seven A is N plus M. That is the overall order. This is what I've just explained. The exponent N and M are called reaction orders. Okay, and the sum of the order, the sum, if you add it up, M plus N, you give you the overall order of the reaction. So if N is one and M is one, the overall order of that reaction is one plus one. And that will give you the overall order. If you are raising your hand, I will listen to you later. Okay, now let's go ahead. The rate law is an expression for the rate as a function of concentration. So once you can write the rate law, then you can begin to explain the effect of concentration. At a fixed temperature, if you change the temperature at the same time as the concentration, it will not work well. And that is why it is important to use a, a thermostat to keep your temperature constant when you are performing this reaction. And we're going to determine the value of N and the value of M in a short while. Look at us, we're back again to this. How do you determine the rate law? To determine the rate law, you have to determine the value of N and the value of M. How do you do that? We're going to do that in a short while. Look at the, what you have on the, board, on, the, on the screen. I've been using it to explain to you so many times. Why are we doing an experiment to find out the value of N and M? It is because reactions are complex. They are made up of steps, multi-steps. Therefore, you need to find out the effect of each of the reactant or the formation of the product. These are steps. Look at it. This is step one. This is step two. And this is step three. The overall order of these, these three steps will give you the overall balanced chemical equation. And that is why, because reactions are made up of steps, elementary steps. They are called processes because they are made up of steps like that, it is important to find out the effect of each reactant on the rate of chemical reaction. Look at that. To determine the order with respect to each of the reactants, equation seven, I showed equation seven A and seven B. What are the orders? What are the exponent? A is, the order of A is N. The order of B is M. So we can determine those orders. Which method are we going to use? We can use a method of comparing the initial rate of each of the reactants. It is necessary to, to study the mechanism by which changes in the concentration of each of the reactants affect the initial rate of the reaction. In a short while, you will know what it means by the initial rate. It affects the, the, the rate when time is equal to zero. And that's what I mean by the initial rate. Okay, now let's go on. Let us perform, look at the experiment on your screen there. A is reacting with B to give you product, which is C. We can give you a product or I can give you products. A is a reactant, B is a reactant. That equation you see on your screen is undefined reaction. Remember again, I told you what you mean by undefined reaction. Let us conduct a hypothetical experiment. For the above reaction, we want to find the order with respect to A. We want to find the order with respect to B. Once we know the order with respect to A, we know the order with respect to B, then you can write the rate law. If I ask you to write for the rate of decrease of A, you just write minus D into concentration of A over DT. Or write for the rate of decrease of B, you write minus D 
into the into the concentration of B, molar concentration over time. You can use any of them, the minus the A, the T, or minus the B, the T, to represent the rate of a reaction. And if you want to write expression, you can write that the rate, which is equal to minus the A over the T, is equal to K into A raised to power N times B raised to power M. Where we are going to look for the value of N and the value of M. That is very clear. So how the initial rate depends on the static concentration. Why must you determine that? It is because the reactions are made up of steps. And that is why we want to find out how A is affecting the formation of product, okay? And how B is also affecting the formation of product. So let's go to the experiment and see what happens. Look at that. What are we going to do? We are going to take a no concentration of each of the reactants. So we prepare like a standard solution, stock solution, which they taught you in school of a no concentration. Reactant A and reactant B. Look at what, what do you mean by initial concentration? Anytime you see the molar concentration of A and you have a source script zero, that means initial concentration of A. And initial concentration of B, you make sure you put a source script zero there. That will give you initial concentration of B. So anytime you see it written like this, it just, an indication that you are referring to the initial concentration. What are we going to do? You keep every other factor constant, except concentration. You want to monitor the effect of concentration on the rate of the reaction. You keep temperature constant. If you don't keep the temperature constant, it means you are looking at two variables and you will not be able to control them effectively. So only concentration is changing. Temperature is constant. That is why you have a thermostat. If you look at your deep freezer at home or your fridge, it will work for some time. Then after so it, will, it will cool the fridge to a certain temperature, then it will trigger off because you have a thermostat there. So you use a kind of thermostat to keep the temperature of the reaction constant. And then why you are changing the concentration. Now we have reactant A and B. What are we going to do to A and B? At any time, I'm going to change the concentration of only one of them, and I keep the other one constant. After I have seen the effect of A, and then I will keep A constant, I change the concentration of B, but I will keep the temperature constant. What do I do? I will take a no amount of A, a solution, a no volume of it, of a standard solution of A. What do I do? I will add it to a known solution of B, you know the volume of B. And then you start your stopwatch. You make sure you monitor your, the time. Yeah, you allow A to react with B. Remember, we are dealing with undefined reaction. If I want to define it, I will say oxygen is reacting with hydrogen. That becomes a defined reaction. Or hydrogen is reacting with nitrogen to give ammonia. But in this case, I'm just using a hypothetical reaction, okay? That I represent oxygen by using A, letter A. And sorry, oxygen will be letter B and the hydrogen, and that is A to give you product, which is H2O. What are we going to do? I'm going to keep concentration of A of B constant. So I'm going to be changing the concentration of A. First of all, I can take 10 moles of A, a solution containing 10 moles, for example, five moles of B, mix them together, and then be monitoring. At any time, I can stop the reaction. What do you mean by stopping the reaction? You can slow the reaction down. You can use ice to freeze it. Then the reaction will come down. At what time? At a particular time, maybe after uh, 30 minutes, I can stop the reaction or slow it down or quench it. Either by freezing it, if I freeze it to a certain temperature, the reaction will not take place. And then I'll be able to know what is the amount of A that has reacted with B. If I started with 10 of A and I stop the reaction after 30 minutes, I will find out now A is eight. 
and I started with 10. That means two most have reacted with B. So I'll be monitoring it. Only A, I will monitor the amount of A left at any time, at any time, until maybe after three hours, after four hours. And so what do I have? I may have A, 10, after 30 minutes. A, 8, after one hour. A, 5, after one and a half hour. A, three moles, after two hours. I will plot a graph. Graphically, I showed you how to plot a graph. I plot a graph of the amount of A that is left with temperature, uh, sorry, with, with uh, time. Or I can decide to monitor maybe amount that has disappeared with time and then find the slope. I taught you how to find the slope of a graph. It could be a curve, it could be a linear graph. The differential, the rate at which the concentration is changing becomes the rate of A. And at the time, at time equal to zero, and I will be able to do that from the graph. And at the rate that I have, you call it initial rate. And then after I have done that, I started with 10 moles of A, keeping B constant. I can go back again and I do another experiment. Each experiment is referred to as a kinetic run, a kinetic experiment. And I can take start again from 10, uh, sorry, from seven moles of A per DM cube. And I take a no volume of it and I add it to a no concentration, a no volume of B. Remember, I did one which I started with 10 moles of A. This experiment I'm going to do again, I can start with seven moles of A. I can keep B constant. And I run it again, I plot a graph. In other words, after about 30 minutes again, I will know the amount of A that is left. Once I know what has left, I can know what is, uh, what is remaining in my reaction system. And so what I have is what is left with time, what is left with time, or I can follow what has, what has disappeared with time. And I do it graphically, I'll plot my graph. Remember, one, I did it at 10 moles of A. Now I'm doing an experiment at seven moles. I will plot a graph again. I will find the slope at time is equal to zero. I've done two now. I can go ahead and do another one again. I can this time another experiment. Each experiment is referred to as a kinetic run. It's on its own. I can collect results and I plot them and I will be able to get a slope. This slope is what is very important. And I will determine that slope at a time equal to zero. That is why I'm calling it initial uh, rate of the reaction. And I, I can start with five moles this time. And I take another run again, collect results, concentration that is remaining and at time. And when I'm satisfied with that experiment, I can run it maybe for three hours or for four hours, I plot a graph, I find another slope. So I have three. Now I can go and do another one, the fourth one, in which I can start with two moles again. But I'm keeping B. I, I can keep B constant throughout while I'm doing this particular experiment. And now we know how A is affecting the rate of formation of the product. When I'm done with A, with maybe three or four experiments, I can go back again and start with B. Keeping A constant, what I did to A, I can do it to B. And I will be able to know the effect of B, how it does affect the rate of chemical reaction. After I have done that, when I plot my graph, I will be able to determine the value of N and the value of M. That is how the experiment is. It is at the end, when I know the value of N and the value of M, I can write the rate law, rate equation, rate expression. Remember. I said rate equation, rate law, rate expression, they mean the same thing. Now let's go, how we'll be able to do that. Okay. Look at this, from what I've just described, this is how you can just remember. If you compare, I'm gonna compare the initial rates. What do you mean by initial? I did one experiment, I used thermos 
for A. I did another one. I used seven moles. I did another one. I used four moles. Okay. And I can go ahead and do another one. I start with three moles. So I have different experiments with A. Remember, the purpose is to find out how A does affect the rate of reaction. It is like you and your friend. You are doing business together. Let's contribute money. What is your friend contributing to the amount that you are going to use to set up the business? What, is, what are you contributing to the amount that can be used to set up the business? And that is why we are looking at each of them. We cannot look at the two of them at the same time. You cannot bring 10. Your friend will bring five. That is the beginning. Then when you now decide to bring four, your friend will remain constant. When you decide to bring three, your friend will remain constant. And then we see how the business is moving from your behavior. When we are done with you, we go back and keep you constant and vary the concentrations of your friend and see how your friend is affecting the business. You find that some of the reactants, they cannot affect a chemical reaction. We refer to them as potatoes. That is why we have to look at each of them and how each of them does affect the rate of reaction. This is how you can remember the experiment I've just performed. You compare the initial rate, which you obtain from your graph. If there is no change in the rate, you refer to the order, the exponent with respect to A as zero. What I mean is this. If you use seven more, 10 moles of A to start the experiment, keep it B constant. Then you change again. Then you now decide to use five moles to start the experiment with A. And you find out that the rate of the reaction is the same thing. It means the order with respect to A is zero. It's like this. Let me give you a trivial example so that I can understand. If I give you 10 naira, go and spend it. You used only two minutes to spend it. Okay. If if uh, I give you, okay, let me leave that, that particular example. You may not be able to catch it very easily. What I'm saying is that whether you start with 10 moles, you start with seven moles, you start with five moles, the rate of the reaction with respect to A is going to be the same thing. Therefore, the order with respect to A is zero. But look at that. If the rate of the reaction is double, if you double the speed, the speed is double. The velocity is double. When you double the concentration, then the order with respect to A is one. Just take note of this point. Later, you're going to find out whether it can be one or it can be greater than one. Remember the first one. If you change the concentration and the order did not change, it means the odd, if you change the concentration and the velocity did not change, it means the order to respect to that reactant is zero. In other words, the rate of reaction is independent of time and also it depends of concentration. Look at this second one. If you double the concentration, you started with 10 moles of A. If you double it and it becomes 20 moles of A and the and again, if the rate is double when the initial concentration of A is also double, then the order respect to A is one. That is, if you double the concentration and the rate is also doubled, it means the order with respect to that particular species is one. Look at another one, three things that you should remember. If the rate increases four times, look at quadruple. You know, you must have heard of quadruple twins and uh, do, uh, triplet and stuff like that. If you if the rate increases four times when the initial concentration of A is double, then the order with respect to A is two. I've given you three conditions now, which you must remember all the time. If you double the concentration and the rate remains the same, it means the order with respect to that is zero. If you double the concentration and the rate is double, the order with respect to that can that reactant is one. If you double the concentration and the rate increases four times, the order with respect to that reactant is two. Once you know the order with respect to each reactant, then you can write the rate law. Now let's go. Maybe you see it here. 
Okay. Look at that. For example, consider the reaction A plus B. A is a gas. That is the status of that uh, A. B is also a gas. Remember, this reaction on the screen, the first one, is undefined reaction. Now you know what it means by undefined reaction. Okay. Look at, after I performed the experiment, I found out that the order with respect to A is one. In other words, when I double the constitution of A, what happened to the rate of the reaction is doubled. Okay, therefore the order with respect to A is one. When I double the concentration of B, I find out that the rate of reaction remains the same thing. Therefore the order with respect to B is zero. So if I ask you to write the rate law of what you have on your screen there, this is how to write the rate law. Rate is equal to K, K must be there. K is referred to as the specific rate constant, okay? A is raised to power one. So N, N here becomes from the experiment I have shown to you. Let me try whether I can give it to you. Look at this place. N here, this is when N is supposed to be when we started. N is equal to one. And M is equal to zero. Therefore, you can write the rate law. If it is zero, we put it. If it is one, you don't put it. If it is two, you can write it there. If it is three, you can write it. If it is 0.5, you can write it. If it is three over two, you can write it. But if it is one, do not write it. Just leave it there. Everyone who can understand the rate expression, we know that you have one there. But if it is zero, I will put it there. Look at one. I find out that the order respect to A is one. The order respect to B is zero. And I put zero there. And where you have one, I did not put it. So anytime you didn't see anything there, there's something there which is equal to one. What is the overall order from what you have here? I told you the overall order is the sum of N, N plus what? Plus M. Look at N is one and M is zero. So the overall order of this reaction is one. The order with respect to A is one. The order with respect to B is zero. If they ask you what is the order with respect to B is zero. Remember, you can write it like this. K, if you do, if you're familiar with, or you can remember your mass, you will know A. Look at that. You can write it like this and put A in there. You know the meaning of this bracket is smaller. Why did I remove this one? Look at that. Any number raised to power zero is what? Is one. A number raised to power zero is one. So if I write it like this, it's the same thing as this. You can decide to remove the B because B is a spectator. Because when I double the concentration of B, it remains the same thing. That means the order with respect to A to B is zero. When I double the concentration of A, the rate was also double. Therefore, the order with respect to A <coughs> is one. Now let's go on. Look at that. The, what I've just written, the last slide I showed to you. Look at this slide. Since the overall order is the sum of the exponent or the sum of the powers, or the sum of the indices, we obtain that the order respect to A is one and the order respect to B is zero. Therefore, the overall order is one. So you know how to get order. You know how to write uh, uh, rate law right now. And I have defined the rate law. It's a function of the concentration of the reactant raised to the appropriate power. What are those powers? Those are what you call exponent indices. And then how do you get them? You have to do experiment. And I'm gonna show you a very good experiment in a short while if we get there today. Look at that. That is the experiment on the screen. Let me see if I can make it wider for you. Okay. Look at what you have on the screen. Look at, if you understand this screen you have, on the, if you understand what you have on this uh, screen, then you'll be able to find out. 
Let me see how I can uh, remove it. Okay. So that to be clearer. Okay, so we're going to write rate expression now. So we're going to, okay, that is good. Look at what you have there. For a hypothetical reaction, which B is reacting with C to form D? Look at B. B is a reactant. C is a reactant. And D is a product. So if I write, ask you to write for the rate of decrease of B, you write minus is one more of B plus one more of C. So you write minus D into the B over the T. You put a minus sign in front of it because it's a reactant. If I ask you to write for the rate of decrease of C, you write minus D into C over the T. And that you can use any of them to represent the rate of the reaction. What about the product plus D, small d, lower case of D into capital D over the time? Look, I want to perform experiment. The reactants are B and C. And I want to write the rate law. I can write that the rate of this reaction is equal to K. What is K? K is the specific rate constant. B raised to power N times C raised to power M. That would be the rate of reaction. What am I doing? Let me put it down very clearly for you. Look at that. The rate of this reaction is like this. Minus D into the molar concentration of B. That is the rate of decrease of B. B over what? Over the small time D. T, okay? And that is equal, you say it is equal, equal to K, this is K into A, oh sorry, into B, raised to what? Raised to the appropriate power. What is the appropriate power? You don't know it, you want to find out. I can put N, for example, then the product of that into C, Okay, you can put M as the power. And then what is the order with respect to B is N. What is the power with respect to C is M. So this is the rest law. So we're going to do experiment because it is made up of steps, multi-steps. We're going to do experiment to find out the effect of B, how B does affect the formation of D and how C does affect the formation of D. Look at the product. The product is the rate of formation of D. And that is, I'm going to just the way, see the way zero, experiment one. I'm going to take 0 0.15 molar of B. This is what I've just described for you using A, using 10 moles of A. I'm going to take it, when I take it, I will take a enough amount of C, 0 0.75 molar. I mix them and then, I find out the rates. This time, I'm not going to monitor B or C. I just want to form, uh, monitor D, amount of D that was formed. I told you, you can monitor the reactant or you can monitor the product. So I'm going to use product to explain to you here. The rate of formation of the product, look at. And that is, if, you if you're French, you bring 0 0.075. And then you will bring 0 0.15. You mix them together. You monitor how the whatever you are forming, which is D. And I was able to form to find out that 3.5 times 10 to minus 3 mole per DMQ per minute was formed. This is the amount that was formed per minute. I am using product now. I have used reactant to explain to you, but this time I'm using product. Remember the rate of reaction is equal to the concentration of only the reactant raised to the appropriate power. Product is not there. But this time I'm monitoring how much of the product did you form. And so I now move to another experiment. When I'm through with this and I've determined, I can get it from initial plot of the formation of D from times equal to zero. Okay, and I find the slope and I'll be able to get, this is my slope. 
And then I moved another experiment. I finished this. I told you this. Look at the second experiment. Let me go to third experiment. Just follow me. Let me skip this so that I can understand. Let me go to experiment three. Look at three. I moved from one to three. What did I do when I got to three? I kept the concentration of B constant. Look at that. Look at that. experiment one and experiment three. I kept the concentration of B constant. Look at experiment one for C. What did I do when I got to three? I double the concentration of C. From here to here, I kept B constant and I double C. What did I do when I double? Look at the amount I formed per minute. It's twice, 3.5 times two. It will give you 7.0. It's double. So from what I've just taught you now, what is the order with respect to C? I kept B constant, 0.15, 0.15. But C, 0 0.075, and I double times two, 0 0.157. Look at what I got. The concentration, the rate rather, is doubled. So what is the meaning of that? From what I just taught you now, what is the other respect to C? Then I said, if you double the concentration and the rate is double, the order with respect to that reactant is one. And then let's take another example of B. Now let's look at B. We are going to keep C constant and vary the concentration of B. You, you must keep one constant. You are comparing like two experiments. I have used experiment one and experiment three to look at C. And I'm going to look at B now. Let me clear the screen so that let me clear, clear the screen so that uh, you'll be able to see it clearly. What am I going to do now? I'm going to keep C constant. How do I keep C constant? Now look this way. Look, the, look, the, look this, look experiment two. Two, look at C, 0 0.15. Look at C, experiment three, 0 0.15. Look at experiment two for B, 0 0.30 molar. Look at experiment three, 0 0.15. If you move from three, can you move from three now? Look at that. Move from three to two, go up, go up, go up. Three to two. What did you do to the concentration of B, double? 0.15, and by the time you go to 0 0.1, 0 0.30, double. So I have doubled the concentration of B. What did you do to C? Look at C. If you move from three to two, look at C. 0 0.15, 0 0.15. I kept C constant and I double B. Okay, look at the concentration. As you go up, 7.0 times 10 to minus 3 times 2. Then when you get here, look at, it will give you 1.40 times 10 minus 2. You've doubled that. If you double the concentration, 3 to 2, I double B. 3 to 2, I kept C constant. 3 to 2, I double the concentration of, of B. If you double the concentration of B, and you double the concentration, the rate rather, of of, uh, of B, what is that supposed to mean? It means the order with respect to B is one. Let me repeat again. If you double the concentration and the, of that particular reactant and the rate is double, the order with respect to that particular species is one. If you double the concentration and the rate increases four times, it means the order with respect to that species is two. If you double the concentration and the rate remains the same thing, the order of that particular species reactant is zero. So once you know the order, and then you can write rate law for a particular reaction. Okay. Now you can write so many uh, rate laws now and see what happened. Look at that.
Okay. You can see on the screen, since the overall order is the sum of this I have taught you. Okay. This is what I taught you earlier. Let's go to the next screen and see what. Uh... Okay. Look at this. So I'm going to use this to give you assignment now. And I wish you can look at over the weekend and see whether you can do it. But if you are very smart, you'll be able to pick it. Let me clean the screen for you so that you can see clearly. I'm going to do experiment now. In this case, I have three reactants. And uh, in case of three reactants, when you have three things, I told you, you keep two constant and you monitor one. At any time, it's only one that you can monitor for your reaction so that you can get the order with respect to that particular reactant. If I ask you, look at what you have on your screen there. If I ask you to write the rate law for this reaction, look at that. One more. Which kind of reaction is this? This is the oxidation of bromate. Sorry, oxidation of bromide by bromate in aqueous system to give you bromine water. And, uh, and this is what you have as reactant, bromine water. If you go to schools where you have, you must have seen bromine water and the color, okay? It looks, it may look brownish, but if you didn't go through such schools, no problem. The bromine water will look a little bit uh, brownish. So this is oxidation of bromide. This is like potassium bromide. This is like bromate. It can be like, maybe like, uh, um, um, it's a bromate anyway. I've removed uh, the first um, element from it. Now this is like ionic equation. Don't worry, one of the lecturers will come and teach you ionic equation. So I have three things reacting. Remember, the order with respect to bromate, to bromate is not one. The order with respect to bromide is not five. The order with respect to the acid is not six. I'm just taking the ionic part of this reactor. And I'm gonna find out what is the effect of bromate, bromide, and acid on the formation of bromine. That's what I want to look at. So I can write a hypothetical equation and look at the equation, rate. I told you rate, you can use any of them to write for the rate of decrease. Rate of decrease, rate of decrease of each of them that we stand for this rate, capital. Look at the lower part of that table. You write that rate, R-A-T-E, is the same thing as the rate of decrease minus D into bromate over DT. And that will be equal to K. What is K? K is the specific rate constant. What is the bromate? Raise it to a power. You can use any of the alphabets except K because automatically K will disappear because K is the specific rate constant. So don't use it as a power. You can use any alphabet you have, A, B, C, D, and all that to represent what is the order of bromate? Call it L. What is the order of bromide? Call it M. What is the order of the acid? Call it N. It is because you do not know L. You do not know the value of M. You do not know the value of N. But in a short while, you are going to find out. I will just use one to explain to you. Look at the relative initial rate of formation of bromine. I have put it there. One, four, eight. I remove experiment five. I didn't put values there. If I put values, you'll be able to do it. Now, let's go on. I want to find the order with respect to bromate. And the value is L. And that L is the order with respect to bromate. M is the order with respect to bromide. And N is the order with respect to the acidic ions that you have there. So what do I do? I'm going to take, let me take the acid. When I take the acid, I will keep the bromate and the bromide constant. And I'll be able to find how the acid does affect the rate of formation of bromine. And I'm not going to do that. Let's go. Look at experiment one. Let me take a value that can, look at it. Experiment one, one. Look at one. What did I do to the acid? I took 0 0.03 molar of the acid of a no volume, and I added it to 0 0.25 of the bromide, and I added 0 0.05 molar 
of a no volume of, of, of this kind of concentration. Remember the value of this that I taught you. Look at all. Oh, it's a smaller concentration. And I add all of them. And I plotted a graph. It depends whether I'm monitoring the formation of bromine. Look at what I put here. Initial rate of formation of bromine. And I got something here. And I just call it one. It's something like this. One times, just give me a few more minutes to finish, times 10 raised to, my, to maybe raised to power three more per dm cube. That is like the concentration. But I've used the lowest to divide all of them. Okay, what do I do? I will keep this constant. I'll keep this constant. And then by the time I move from here, look at this. I kept experiment two, I kept this constant. I go to bromide, I kept this constant. Then by the time I go to the acid, I doubled it 0. 0.3 times 2, 0. 0.6. When I did that, I found out that the rate of formation of bromine has increased four times. What is that supposed to mean? Quadruple. It means the order with respect to the acid is what? Is two. That's what I taught you today. When I double the concentration of the acid, the rate of formation of the bromine increased four times. But I kept this constant, and I kept this constant. What do I do again? Look at what I'm going to do. I have, so I know the order. The order with respect to the acid is equal to two. And then how do I find the order with respect to bromate? Look at that. I want to, this is bromate. How do I find the order with respect to bromate? It is very easy. Look at that. Bromate. I will take experiment one. And I will take experiment three. From experiment one to experiment three, what did I do? Experiment one to experiment. Look at one is 0 0.05. By the time I will take one and three, because I want to see the effect of bromate. But when I go to the, the bromide, look at that. I will keep it constant, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. But look at how, how much bromine was formed. Look at that. Oh, 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 okay, 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 okay. There's something missing. Okay, look at this. Let me let me take it this way. I'll go over that again. Look at take experiment two and experiment three. Take experiment two and experiment three. Look at experiment two and experiment three. Point zero five and point one zero. So I doubled it. Look at this one. Point two five, point two five. Look at the acid. 0 .0, 0 .0, 0 .0. Look at that. I kept this constant and I kept this constant. And I will be able to find the order with respect to bromate. 0 0.05, 0 0.10. From, from two to three for bromate, I double. Look at how it increases. Point four to eight is four doubled. If you double four, what do you have? Eight. So if you double the rate, what is the order with respect to bromate? I told you if you double the concentration and you double the rate, what is the order with respect to bromate? One. And so I have found two for you now. For acid, it is two. For the bromate, it is one. And so when you come here, you've just discovered that for bromate, L is equal to one. You remove the one L and put one there. You don't write the one there. Just leave it. Everybody will know it is one. And then you go to the hydrogen ion. You remove the N, and then you write two here. Remember, this L is going to be one. Then for the, bro the bromide, look at the values. I'm not giving you values. And I'm going to give this one to you as a test. So if I put values here, you can solve it. Right now, there are no values there. And then you cannot solve it. So what did we do today? I've been able to explain to you, okay, what the effect of concentration, and I'll be able to explain to you why you should write a rate law. What is a rate law? And I did say is the a rate law is the experimental relationship between the rate of the reaction 
and the concentration of the reactant raised to appropriate power. And how can we write the rate law? Look at that. This is what I have been solving for you all along. Look at what I've just done. This is the mathematics. And this evening, I'm going to upload these lectures so you can download tonight. And then you can see the details. If you don't understand, you can ask anybody. We can, uh, your, some of your classmates, they're actually picking it. This is how I was able to solve it. And I will take experiment one, and I take another experiment and take all the concentration. What I was doing was very clear. And that is, I can cancel this, I can cancel this, I can cancel this, cancel this, and this will be left. And that is what I have. Mathematically, one over four is one over two raised to power two. And this expression that is in there mathematically, if you don't know this math, just ask those who do math. They will explain it to you. And that is the same thing as one over two raised to power n. What is the value of n? The value of n is equal to two. And that's how I was able to get two for the one of the acid. And so that is how to calculate the rate law and how you have to, um, uh, to calculate the exponent by doing experiment. Later, we will look at elementary equations, how you can predict the order of a reaction without doing experiment. That is a different kind of approach. How you can get the exponent, how you can get the order of respect to each of the reactors. Once I declare that a particular reaction is an elementary process. So this is where I will, I will stop and I'm gonna upload it, what I taught you this evening. And then you can look at it, try and get to the platform and download and read through. If you don't understand, you can always let us know. For those of you who are raising your hands, and I don't have uh, no time again for questions, but just keep reading it. I will continue from there next week. How you can write the red law from the slowest step of a chemical reaction. Remember, we've written the red law. We've looked at all the expressions there, except the specific rate constant. We're going to find units for the specific rate constant. We're going to look at elementary reaction, how you can write a rate law and without doing the experiment from the molecularity of the reactant. So ladies and gentlemen, have a nice weekend. You're welcome.